Welcome back class. We are on chapter six of All Quiet in the Western Front. There are rumors of an offensive. We go up to the front two days earlier than usual. On the way, we pass a shelled schoolhouse. Stacked up against its longer side is a high double wall of yellow, unpolished, brand new coffins. They still smell of resin and pine and the forest. There are at least a hundred. That's a good preparation for the offensive, says Mueller, astonished. They're for us, growls Dietering. Don't talk rot, says Cat to him angrily. You be thankful if you get so much as a coffin, grins Jaden. They'll slip you a waterproof sheet for your old Aunt Sally as a carcass. So they get the contrast of that. You have a schoolhouse, um, and leaning against it are the coffins. And of course, the schoolhouse has been destroyed. Um, it's been shelled out. And the coffins are brand new, fresh, looking great. So the contrast of those two, a destroyed schoolhouse, normally you would expect that to be a more pleasant location. And then we have these really nice, not destroyed coffins that are normally associated with the death that's been wreaked on the schoolhouse. So some juxtaposition there. The other is jest too, or joke, unpleasant joke. But what else can a man do? The coffins really are for us. The organization surpasses itself in that kind of thing. Ahead of us, everything is shimmering. The first night we try to get our bearings. When it is fairly quiet, we can hear the transports behind the enemy lines rolling ceaselessly until dawn. Cat says that they do not go back, but are bringing up troops, troops, munitions, and guns. The English artillery has been strengthened. That we can detect at once. There are at least four more batteries of nine inch guns to the right of the farm and behind the poplars they have put in trench mortars. Besides these, they have brought up a number of those little French beasts with instantaneous fuses. We are now in low spirits. After we have been in the dugouts two hours, our own shells begin to fall in the trench. This is the third time in four weeks. If it were simply a mistake in aim, no one would say anything. But the truth is that the barrels are worn out. The shots are often so uncertain that they land within our own lines. Two nights, two of our men were wounded by them. So this is what we call friendly fire, when your own side is um, firing on itself. And he says if it was just an accident, um, it wouldn't be so bad, but it keeps happening simply because the, the barrels are worn down. Their weaponry is wearing out and they're not able to replace it. We see Germany here being worn down by the war. The front is a cage in which we must make wait fearfully for whatever may happen. So we have metaphor going on here. We lie under the network of arching shells and live in a suspense of uncertainty. Over us, chance hovers. If a shot comes, we can duck. That is all. We neither know nor can determine where it will fall. If it, it is this chance that makes us indifferent. A few months ago, I was sitting in a dugout playing scat. Remember scat card game. After a while, I stood up and went to visit some friends in another dugout. On my return, nothing more was to be seen of the first one. It had been blown to pieces by a direct hit. I went back to see the second and arrived just in time to lend a hand digging it out. In the interval, it had been buried. So he was in one and he leaves to go to the other one and um, sees that that one um, is destroyed. And when he's going back, um, the other one had just been hit. So just total random chance that he didn't get killed in either of these. And it is just a matter of chance that I am still alive as that I might have been hit. In a bomb-proof dugout, I may be smashed to atoms, and in the open, I may survive 10 hours of bombardment unscathed. No soldier outlives a thousand chances, but every soldier believes in chance and trusts his luck. So think about why is chance capitalized there? What is um, the author trying to do by capitalizing that? Um, we must look out for our bread. The rats have become much more numerous lately because the trenches are no longer in good condition. Dietering says it is a sure sign of a coming bombardment. Remember those videos we watched at the beginning of the, the book? Okay, those videos from the History Channel on these trenches um, being just muddy and wet and damp all the time and cold and miserable. The rats here are particularly repulsive. They are so fat, the kind we all call coarse rats. 
They have shocking, evil, naked faces, and it is nauseating to see their long, nude tails. They seem to be mighty hungry. Almost every man has had his bread gnawed. Crap wrapped his in his waterproof sheet and put it under his head, but he cannot sleep because they run over his face to get at it. Dietering meant to outwit them. He fastened a thin wire to the roof and suspended his bread from it. During the night when he switched on his pocket torch, that's a flashlight, he saw the wire swinging to and fro. On the bread was riding a fat rat. At last we put a stop to it. We cannot afford to throw the bread away because then we should have nothing left to eat in the morning. So we carefully cut off the bits of bread that the animals have gnawed. The slices we cut off are heaped together in the middle of the floor. Each man takes out his shovel and lies down, prepared to strike. Dietering, Crop, and Cat hold their pocket torches or flashlights ready. After a few minutes, we hear the first shuffling and tugging. It grows. Now it is the sound of many little feet. Then the flashlights switch on, and every man strikes at the heap, which scatters with a rush. The results are good. We toss the bits of rat over the parapet and again lie in wait. Several times we repeat the process. At last the beasts get wise to it, or perhaps they have scented the blood, and they return no more. Nevertheless, before morning, the remainder of the bread on the floor has been carried off. In the adjoining sector, they attacked two large cats and a dog, bit them to death, and devoured them. Next day, there was an issue of Edamar cheese. Each man gets almost a quarter of a cheese. In one way, that is all to the good, for Edamar cheese is tasty. But in another way, it is vile, because the fat red balls have long been a sign of a bad time coming. Our forebodings increase as rum is served out. We drink it, of course, but are not greatly comforted. So getting the cheese and getting the rum, to them, they, they know these are signs of the army wearing out. They're running out of things to feed the people. Um, they're running out. And so this is like just the last things that the army can gather together to give them to eat. During the day, we loaf about and make war on the rats. Ammunition and hand grenades become more plentiful. We overhaul the bayonets, that is to say, the ones that have a saw on the blunt edge. So the bayonet is the blade that would go on the end of the, the rifle, the gun. If the fellows over there catch a man with one of these, he gets killed on sight. In the next sector, some of our men were found where whose noses were cut off and their eyes poked out with their own saw bayonet. Their mouths and noses were stuffed with sawdust so that they suffocated. Some of the recruits have bayonets of this sort and we take them away and give them the ordinary kind. So having a bayonet with a saw on the end is um, seen as too ruthless in war, um, I guess because they do so much more damage when you stab someone with them, um, as opposed to one with just a, a straight sharp edge. But the bayonet has practically lost its importance. It is usually the fashion now to charge with bombs and spades only, or shovels. The sharpened spade is a more handy and many-sided weapon. Not only can it be used for jabbing a man under the chin, but it is much better for striking with because of its greater weight. And if one hits between the neck and shoulder, it easily cleaves as far down as the chest. The bayonet frequently jams on the thrust, and then the man has to kick hard on the other fellow's belly to pull it out again. And in the interval, he may easily get one himself. And what's more, the blade often gets broken off. Think about what he's describing there. And even just the way that I read it. Um, he's describing in just very practical terms, um, in very factual terms, a horrible, awful thing. He's talking about the most efficient way to kill the enemy soldier with a shovel and why a shovel is better than a bayonet or where, where you should thrust with the bayonet um, and the danger of, of, of why striking there. Um, a horrible, awful thing, but the speaker, the narrator is just stating it like plain facts. Um, the way that they've just, um, they talk about really deadly topics in this really practical way because that's all war has become to them. At the night, at night they send over gas. We expect the attack to follow and lie with our masks on, ready to tear them off as soon as the first shadow appears. Dawn approaches without anything happening, only the everlasting nerve-wracking roll behind the enemy lines. Trains, trains, lorries, lorries. But what are they concentrating? Our artillery fire is on it continually, but still it does not cease. We have tired faces and avoid each other's eyes. It will be like the Somme, says Cat gloomily. There we were shelled steadily for seven days and nights. 
So remember the psalm, okay, that was in one of the videos that we watched. Um, that was the uh, one of the deadliest battles um, in history. Up to that point, it was the deadliest day for casualties for Great Britain. Um, the bombardment lasted for so long and it just did not take out the enemy like it was expected to. Um, but a, a little quote I have written in here, um, someone, a historian said, um, Psalm, the whole history of the world cannot contain a more ghastly word. So that word just brings terror in, into people. Cat has lost all fun since we have been here, which is bad, for Cat is an old front hog and can smell what is coming. Only Jaden seems pleased with the good rations and the rum. He thinks we might even go back to rest without anything happening at all. It almost looks like it. Day after day passes. At night, I squat in the listening post. Above me, the rockets and parachute lights shoot up and float down again. I am cautious and tense. My heart thumps. My eyes turn again and again to the luminous dial of my watch. The hands will not budge. Sleep hangs on my eyelids. I work my toes and my boots in order to keep awake. Nothing happens till I am relieved, only the everlasting rolling over there. Gradually we grow calmer and play scat and poker continually. Perhaps we will be lucky. All day the sky is hung with observation balloons. Remember, those are those blimps I showed you, um, those big blimps that they float up and there's someone in a basket at the bottom so they can see the other side better. There is a rumor that the enemy are going to put tanks over and use low flying planes for the attack but that interests us less than what we hear of the new flamethrowers. We wake up in the middle of the night. The earth booms. Heavy fire is falling on us. We crouch into corners. We distinguish shells of every caliber. Each man lays hold of his things and looks every, again every minute to reassure himself that they are still there. The dugout heaves. The night roars and flashes. We look at each other in the momentary flashes of light and with pale faces and pressed lips shake our heads. So the bombardment has started. They're in a dugout um, hoping to survive it. Every man is aware of the heavy shells tearing down the parapet, rooting up the embankment and demolishing the upper layers of concrete. When a shell lands in the trench, we note how the hollow furious blast is like a blow from the paw of a raging beast of prey. Already by morning, a few of the recruits are green and vomiting. They are too inexperienced. Slowly the gray light trickles into the post and pales the flashes of the shells. Morning has come. The explosion of mines mingles with the gunfire. That is the most dementing convulsion of all. The whole region where they go up becomes one grave. The reliefs go out. The observers stagger in, covered with dirt and trembling. One lies down in silence in the corner and eats. The other, an older man of the new draft, sobs. Twice he has been flung over the parapet by the blast of the explosions without getting any more than shell shock. The recruits are eyeing him. We must watch them. These things are catching and already some lips begin to quiver. It is good that it is growing daylight. Perhaps the attack will come before noon. So they said we have to watch the recruits. These things are catching. Um, people's mental states are going to start to break down. And when one person finally cracks or snaps under all that pressure, other people start snapping very quickly. The bombardment does not diminish. It is falling in the rear too. As far as one can see spouts fountains of mud and iron. A wide belt is being raked. The attack does not come, but the bombardment continues. We are gradually benumbed. Hardly a man speaks. We cannot make ourselves understood. So it's so loud that even if they try to talk, no one, no one can understand you. Our trench is almost gone. In many places, it is only 18 inches high. It is broken by holes and craters and mountains of earth. A shell lands square in front of our post, and once it is dark, we are buried and must dig ourselves out. After an hour, the entrance is clear again, and we are calmer because we have had something to do. Their trench spot is only 18 inches deep, okay? That's one and a half feet. That's like this much. That's the trench that you're trying to hide in. Our company commander scrambles in and reports that two dugouts are gone. The recruits calm themselves when they see him. He says that an attempt will be made to bring up food this evening. Well, that sounds reassuring. No one had thought of it except Jaden. Now the outside world seems to draw a little nearer. If food can be brought up, the recruits think, then it really can't be that bad. 
we don't disabuse them. We know that food is as important as ammunition and only for that reason must it be brought up. But it miscarries. A second party goes out and it also turns back. Finally, Cat tries and even he reappears without accomplishing nothing. No one gets through. Not even a fly is small enough to get through such a barrage. We pull in our belts tire and chew every mouthful three times as long. Still, the food does not last out. We are damnably hungry. I take out a scrap of bread, eat the white, and put the crust back in my knapsack. From time to time, I nibble at it. So the food can't be brought up. The bombardment's too heavy. They can't get anything up to the front line where Paul and his unit are. The night is unbearable. We cannot sleep, but we stare ahead of us and doze. Jaden regrets that we wasted the gnawed pieces of bread on the rat. He would gladly have them again to eat now. We are short of water too, but not seriously yet. Towards morning, while it is still dark, there is some excitement. Through the entrance rushes in a swarm of fleeing rats that try to storm the walls. Torches light up the confusion. Everyone yells and curses and slaughters. The madness and despair of many hours unloads itself in this outburst. Faces are distorted, arms strike out, and the beasts scream. We just stop in time to avoid attacking one another. The onslaught has exhausted us. We lie down to wait again. It is a marvel that our post has had no casualties so far. It is one of the less deep dugouts. A corporal creeps in. He has a loaf of bread with him. Three people have had the luck to get through during the night and bring some provisions. They say the bombardment extends undiminished as far as the artillery lines. It is a mystery where the enemy gets all his shells. We wait and wait. By midday, what I expect happens. One of the recruits has a fit. I have been watching him for a long time, grinding his teeth and opening and shutting his fists. These hunted, protruded eye, protruding eyes, we know them too well. During the last few hours, he has had merely the appearance of calm. He had collapsed like a rotten tree. Now he stands up, stealthily creeps across the floor, hesitates a moment and then glides towards the door. I intercept him to say, where are you going? I'll be back in a minute, says he, and tries to push past me. Wait a bit, the shelling will stop soon. He listens for a moment and his eyes become clear. Then again, he has the glowering eyes of a mad dog. He is silent and he shoves me aside. One minute, lad, I say. Cat notices. Just as the recruit shakes me off, Cat jumps in and we hold him. Then he begins to rave, leave me alone, let me go out, I will go out. He won't listen to anything and hits out. His mouth is wet and pours out words, half choked, meaningless words. It is a case of claustrophobia, he feels, as though he is suffocating here and wants to get out at any price. If we let him go, he would run about everywhere regardless of cover. He is not the first. So he, he snapped. Um, he's in this dugout being bombarded for hours and hours on end. He can't take it. He needs to get out. But of course, as soon as he stands up out of the dugout, he's going to get shot and killed. So they're trying to stop him. Though he raves and his eyes roll, it can't be helped. We have to give him a hiding to bring him to his senses. A hiding is a beating, so they beat him to his senses. We do it quickly and mercilessly, and at last he sits down quietly. The others have turned pale. Let's hope it deters them. This bombardment is too much for the poor devils. They have been sent straight from a recruiting depot into a barrage that is enough to turn an old soldier's hair gray. After this affair, the sticky, close atmosphere works more than ever on our nerves. We sit as if in our grave, only waiting to be closed in. Suddenly it howls and flashes terrifically. The dugout cracks in all its joints under a direct hit. Fortunately, only a light one with the concrete blocks are able to withstand. It rings metallically. The walls reel. Rifles, helmets, earth, mud, and dust fly everywhere. Sulfur fumes pour in. If we were in one of those light dugouts that they have been building lately instead of this deeper one, none of us would be alive. But the effect is bad enough even so. The recruit starts to rave again and two others follow suit. One jumps up and rushes out and we have trouble with the other two. I start after one who escapes and wonder whether to shoot him in the leg. Then it shrieks again. I fling myself down and when I stand up, the wall of the trench is plastered with sm smoking splinters, lumps of flesh and bits of uniform. I scramble back. The first recruit seems actually to have gone insane. He butts his head against the wall like a goat. We must try tonight to take him to the rear. Meanwhile, we bind him, tie him up, but in such a way that in case of attack, he can be released at once. So they had that hit. 
um, and it killed one of the recruits that was trying to escape. Cat suggests a game of scat. It is easier when a man has something to do, but it is no use. We listen for every explosion that comes close. We miscount the tricks and we fail to follow suit. We have to give it up. We sit as though in a boiler that is being belabored from without on all sides. Night again. We are deadened by the strain, a deadly tension that scrapes along one's spine like a gap knife. Our legs refuse to move, our hands tremble, our bodies are a thin skin stretched painfully over repressed madness, over an almost irresistible bursting roar. We have neither flesh nor muscle any longer. We dare not look at one another for fear of some miscalculable thing. So we shut our teeth. It will end. It will end. Perhaps we will come through. Suddenly the nearer explosion stops. The shelling continues, but it has lifted and falls behind us. Our trench is free. We seize the hand grenades, pitch them out in front of the dugout and jump after them. The bombardment has stopped and a heavy barrage now falls behind us. The attack has come. So remember what we talked about, the, the system of trench warfare. Um, one side bombards, bombards, bombards for hours, days, weeks. And then as soon as it stops, the attack is coming. They're sending out their soldiers. They're hoping they've weakened the other side enough that their soldiers will be able to attack and do some damage. No one would believe that in this howling waste there could still be men, but steel helmets now appear on all sides of the trench, and 50 yards from us the machine gun is already in position and barking. The wire entanglements are torn to pieces, yet they offer some obstacle. We see the stormtroops coming. Our artillery opens fire. Machine guns rattle, rifles crack. The charge works its way across. High and crop begin with the hand grenades. They throw as fast as they can. Others pass them. The handles with the strings already pulled. High throws 75 yards, crop 60. It has been measured. The distance is important. The enemy as they run cannot do much before they are within 40 yards. We recognize the smooth, distorted faces, the helmets. They are French. They have already suffered heavily when they reach the remnants of the barbed wire entanglements. A whole line has gone down before our machine guns. Then we have a lot of stoppages and they come nearer. I see one of them, his face upturned, fall into a wire cradle. His body collapses. His hands remain suspended as though he were praying. Then his body drops clean away and only his hands with the stumps of his arms shot off, now hang in the wire. The moment we are about to retreat, three faces rise up from the ground in front of us. Under one of the helmets, a dark pointed beard and two eyes that are fastened on me. I raise my hand, but I cannot throw into those strange eyes. For one mad moment, the whole slaughter whirls like a circus around me, and these two eyes alone are motionless. Then the head rises up, a hand, a movement, and my hand grenade flies through the air and into him. We make for the rear, pull wire cradles into the trench, and leave bombs behind us with the strings, strings pulled, which ensures us a fiery retreat. The machine guns are already firing from the next position. We have become wild beasts. We do not fight. We defend ourselves against annihilation. It is not against men that we fling our bombs. What do we know of men in this moment when death is hunting us down? Now, for the first time in three days, we can see his face. Now, for the first time in three days, we can oppose him. We feel a mad anger. No longer do we lie helpless, waiting on the scaffold. We can destroy and kill to save ourselves, to save ourselves, and to be revenged. So for three days, they've been bombarded, and they couldn't see the enemy. They couldn't see his face. Now they finally have a chance to, to do something about that awful treatment that they received for those three days. So it's like a kind of revenge they can finally have. We crouch behind every corner, behind every barrier of barbed wire, and hurl heaps of explosives at the feet of the advancing enemy before we run. The blast of the hand grenades impinges powerfully on our arms and legs. Crouching like cats, we run on, overwhelmed by this wave that bears us along, that fills us with ferocity, turns us into thugs, into murderers, into God only knows what devils. This wave that multiplies our strength with fear and madness and greed of life, seeking and fighting for nothing but our deliverance. If your own father came over with them, you would not hesitate to fling a bomb at him. The forward trenches have been abandoned. Are they still trenches? They are blown to pieces, annihilated. There are only broken bits of trenches, holes linked by cracks, nests of craters, that is all. But the enemy's casualties increase. 
they did not count on so much resistance. It is nearly noon. The sun blazes hotly. The sweat stings in our eyes. We wipe it off on our sleeves and often blood with it. At last, we reach a trench that is in a somewhat better condition. It is manned and ready for the counterattack. It receives us. Our guns open in full blast and cut off the enemy attack. Our lines behind us stop. They can advance no farther. The attack is crushed by our artillery. We watch. The fire lifts 100 yards and we break forward. Beside me, a lance corporal has his head torn off. He runs a few steps more while the blood spouts from his neck like a fountain. It does not come quite to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting. They are driven back. We arrive once again at our shattered trench and pass on beyond it. Oh, this turning back again. We reach the shelter of the reserves and yearn to creep in and disappear. But instead, we must turn around and plunge again into the horror. If we were not automata, robots, at that moment, we would continue lying there, exhausted and without will. But we are swept forward again, powerless, madly savage and raging. We will kill, for they are still our mortal enemies. Their rifles and bombs are aimed against us, and if we don't destroy them, they will destroy us. The brown earth, the torn, blasted earth, with a greasy shine under the sun's rays. The earth is the background of this restless, gloomy world of robots. Our gasping is the scratching of a quill. Our lips are dry, our heads are debauched with stupor. Thus we stagger forward and into our pierced and shattered souls bores the torturing image of the brown earth with the greasy sun and the convulsed and dead soldiers. Who lie there, it can't be helped. Who cry and clutch at our legs as we spring away over them. We have lost all feeling for one another. We can hardly control ourselves when our glance lights on the form of some other man. We are insensible dead men who through some trick, some dreadful magic, are still able to run and to kill. So we're getting this horrific imagery of the soldiers running and their own men, their own side, there's wounded men laying there in no man's land, grabbing at them for help. And they can't stop, they have to keep going. The young Frenchman lags behind, he is overtaken. He puts up his hands and one he still holds a revolver. Does he mean to shoot it or to give it himself? A blow from a spade cleaves through his face. A second sees it and tries to run farther. A bayonet jabs into his back. He leaps in the air, his arms throw wide, his mouth wide open. Yelling, he staggers. In his back, the bayonet quivers. A third throws away his rifle, cowers down with his hands before his eyes. He is left behind with a few other prisoners to carry off the wounded. Suddenly in the pursuit, we reach the enemy line. So they, they've reached the, the other side's trenches. We are so close on the heels of our retreating enemies that we reach it almost at the same time as they. In this way, we suffer few casualties. A machine gun barks, but is silenced with a bomb. Nevertheless, a couple of seconds has sufficed to give us five stomach wounds. With the butt of his rifle, Cat smashes the pulp the face of one of the unwounded machine gunners. We bayonet the others before they have time to get out their bombs. Then thirstily, we drink the water they have for cooling the gun. So we're gonna see that again. Um, these, these guns um, constantly going, these machine guns build up a great deal of friction and they get incredibly hot. And if they're not constantly cooled with water, the metal will warp from the heat and then they won't work anymore. So they have to constantly be cooling them with water. And Paul and his men are so thirsty that they're drinking this cooling water. Everywhere, wire cutters are snapping. Planks are thrown across the entanglement. We jump through the narrow entrances into the trenches. Ty strikes his spade into the neck of a gigantic trenchman and throws the first hand grenade. We duck behind the breastwork for a few seconds, and then the straight bit of trench ahead of us is empty. The next throw whizzes obliquely over the corner and clears the passage. As we run past, we toss handfuls down into the dugout. The earth shudders. It crashes, smokes, and groans. We stumble over slippery lumps of flesh, over yielding bodies. I fall into an open belly on which lies a clean new officer's cap. The fight ceases. We lose touch with the enemy. We cannot stay here long, but what must retire under cover of our artillery to our own position. No sooner do we know this than we dive into the nearest dugout and with the utmost haste seize on whatever provisions we can see, especially the tins of corned beef and butter before we clear out. We get back pretty well. There is no further attack by the enemy. We lie for an hour, panting and resting before anyone speaks. 
We are so completely played out that in spite of our great hunger, we do not think of the provisions. Then gradually we become something like men again. Again, we see this motif, uh, this repeated image coming up. When they're at the front, when they're fighting, they're no longer people. They become human beasts. They become animals. And Paul says earlier, they have to be. They have to act on the animal instinct or they would be dead in an instant. He even said earlier, if your own father was coming at you on the other side, you would not hesitate to kill him because of that animal instinct that takes you over. But once you retreat back from the front, you become human again. The corned beef over there is famous along the whole front. Occasionally, it has been the chief reason for a flying raid on our part, for our nourishment is generally very bad. We have a constant hunger. So again, the other side is eating much better than the Germans. The Germans are getting worn down more so than the French and the British. We bagged five tins altogether. The fellows over there are well looked after. They fare magnificently, as against us poor starving wretches with our turnip jam. They can get all the meat they want. Pie has scored a thin loaf of white French bread and stuck it behind his belt like a spade. It is a bit bloody at one corner, but that can be cut off. It is a good thing that we've had something decent to eat at last. We still have to a use for all our strength. Enough to eat is just as valuable as a good dugout. It can save our lives. That is the reason we are so greedy for it. Jaden has captured two water bottles full of cognac. We pass them around. And cognac is a, a kind of alcoholic drink. All right, that's where I'm going to stop. We are about halfway through chapter six.